Okay, good morning everyone and thank you all for joining us for our Beef Brunch Educational Series webinar today. My name is Ashley Edwards and I'll be hosting for y'all. Our speakers today are Mr. Lee Falk, who is a regional livestock agent for us in the northwest part of the state, and Mr. Jason Holmes, who is a regional livestock specialist for us in the northeast part of the state. Um, Lee and Jason today are going to be tag teaming and discussing basic marketing strategies. I know this is something that we get a lot of questions about. Um, I see, you know, quite a few of y'all online already ready to listen to this. And so um, I think it's a, a very important topic and even so right now with everything very timely. So just a few housekeeping notes before I turn it over to them. Um, your microphones are muted and we're going to keep them that way throughout the entire webinar. If you've joined us online, um, either through the link or through the Teams app, there's a Q&A box that you can put questions into at any time during the presentation. Um, if you are calling in, so if you're just listening to the voice um, of this, you can text questions to me. My number is 512-818-5476. So again, if you've called in um, and you're listening to us, you can text questions to me at any time in the webinar. Um, that number is 512-818-5476. In the interest of time, we are going to wait and answer questions at the end of the presentation after both speakers. So with that, Lee and Jason, thank you all for taking the time to be with us this morning. Jason, you can go ahead and unmute and begin whenever you're ready. All right, thank you, ma'am. Can you all hear me OK? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, so you got to give you a little bit of uh, background on on this talk uh, before we get into the meat of it. Whenever Lee and I first started uh, talking about doing this, uh, we were just talking about what our options were and uh, which direction we wanted to go with the talk. So and we divide, decided ultimately that, uh, that we just wanted to focus on that calf crop. So cow calf producers uh, producing a calf, uh, selling that calf directly at weaning or carrying it to a, uh, a feeder type that uh, that 750 800 pound calf um, and then marketing it from there. Um, uh, for the sake of time in this one, uh, we just opted not to uh, to get into the the marketing of of coal cows, coal bulls and those kind of things. And we we fully understand and, and realize the fact that they do have value on your operations, but uh, we we decided that we may hold that one for another day. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, at that time. But today we're just going to talk basically about marketing strategies of that calf crop. So that advanced way too fast. There we go. Uh, so whenever we talk about uh, um, the the calf market, the feeder market, there's uh, there's a good bit of pricing differentials that I think we need to have a a good grasp on and a good understanding of uh, whenever we start talking about uh, um, being being good market of marketers of our cattle. Um, and you've always heard the 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 old saying that uh, it's better to be uh, a price setter than a price taker. Um, so we're going to talk about some of those things today of how you can uh, more effectively be a, a marketer of those cattle or and a seller of those those calves on your on your operation. So the discovery of feed cattle prices involves the interaction of many factors. I don't think that there is any day and time um, that that statement does not represent than what we're seeing right now on a geopolitical scale um, and the, the adverse effects or effects or the, the trickle down effect that it is having on uh, all of our uh, publicly traded markets, all of our agricultural markets. Uh, that's uh, there's a lot of factors today. We're going to talk more about just the we're going to stay away from all the geopolitical happenings and all of that. We're going to focus mainly on the things that um, fundamentally affect uh, those pricing differentials. So um, I guess Lee's word here would be rudimentary. So the elementary beef cattle fundamentals tell us that that value of that calf or that feeder uh, is going to be greatly affected by uh, their eventual value further down the production line or further up the production line, however you want to look at that progression. 
and the cost that it takes us to move them from that uh, that cow calf operation uh, through potentially a stalker backgrounder operation and ultimately into a feed yard. Um, uh, so that uh, what does that cost us to move us move that calf or that feeder through those uh, through those production lines? So that's very basic uh, elementary. So while we're talking elementary, I think the next thing that you have to talk about is just overall supply and demand and the differences in supply and demand and how they affect uh, the cost of that commodity um, overall. So we'll look at a few a uh, few slides in just a second in terms of um, a broad picture uh, over a decade or so of how that uh, that price and um, that supply and demand fundamental uh, affects our returns on a cow calf operation. And we'll also look at just some historics in terms of uh, pricing history on those calves. Uh, when we say calves, we're talking in that 500 uh, to 600 pound range. And then also on those feeders, again, what we're talking about in terms of that 7 to 800 pound calf. Several studies have investigated the uh, the long run pricing differentials associated with our feeder cattle supply. So cattle inventories, cost of gain, specifically what we're talking about there is corn. Um, and if you if you watch the corn markets, uh, that cost of gain is going to be directly proportional in the feed yards. And again, that is part of that production chain that that calf has to go through. Uh, so that is ultimately going to have a, a direct effect on those feeder cattle. It's often said that uh, that that shouldn't cost of corn should not really affect our fed cattle, those fat cattle that are finished. Um, but ultimately, sometimes we do see that it does have some effect on that. But ultimately, it should we should see effects on our feeder cattle in terms of that cost of gain. And then also live feeder live and feeder cattle futures. Um, yeah, it frustrates a lot of us how the futures market does affect our cash prices, uh, but that's just the world that we live in today, and we know that it does have some effect on that. However, those long run pricing differentials don't really help us quantify those short run premiums and discounts that we see at our auction market. So that's what Lee is going to spend a good bit of his time talking on in terms of those. Uh, how can we do a better job? on farm and things that may not cost you uh, a lot of money. Some of these are not going to cost you a lot of money. They're just going to cost you a little bit more time and effort just in terms of managing some of the so you can get some of those premiums and quit taking some of those discounts at those auction markets. Um, so those physical traits uh, um, of those individual lots of, of feeders or calves uh, do apparently have the greatest influence on that short run differential, price differential. So what we're talking about is sex. Steer heifer, do they have horns or not? Are they castrated or not? Uh, what is the weight? What is the lot size? Are they singles? Are you selling in groups of 20? Are you selling in groups of 50? Uh, what is the breed type? So when we talk about breed type, we're going to talk about um, uh, hair coat color and things like that. What is the health? Are they generally healthy? Have you given them any vaccines? Uh, what is the grade? So as we go through this, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, what are our feeder cattle grades and how do we use them to, to do a better job of uniformly grouping cattle together? Uh, what is the body condition? Um, and what is the time of sale? Um, and so there's a good bit of information out there about the, the time of the day, time of day for that sale. Uh, and then we'll also talk about time of year a little bit. Uh, so all of those along with current fed cattle cash prices uh, is what ultimately has the largest short run uh, effect on those price differentials. Uh, so thankfully, and I'll try not to do, dive off too far in the weeds on this statement, but thankfully the cattle industry does remain largely segmented. Uh, so I've got in parentheses there as opposed to vertically integrated. Um, so if you're familiar with the uh, the broiler chicken market, uh, the swine market, those markets are are widely uh, vertically integrated, uh, which means that the uh, the company uh, has control of all segments of that chain, uh, all the way from marketing 
down to the the baby animal whenever it's placed on farm the feed uh, they they have control of that market all the way through each one of those segments uh, so because the cattle industry is uh, ultimately still segmented it creates opportunities for us on farm on farm managers uh, to make uh, decisions relative to some of the things that we're going to talk about today uh, it gives you marketing options so that is one of the great things about the cattle industry is we do have a variety of marketing options in terms of selling on a cash market and an open market at your local sale barn uh, all the way through selling um, on a uh, on a forward contract uh, all the way through selling on a futures market and then ultimately price discovery uh, there's a lot of uh, um, opportunities for price discovery through usda reports um, and we've uh, I think we've got to be very careful in this industry uh, not to let some of that price discovery go away. I think we need to remain educated about that and uh, and always speak up for uh, the importance of that price discovery and our ability to uh, to be able to go out and find those reports and see what those prices are uh, are currently doing at uh, at any given time of the year. So as we look at some of these charts, um, I think uh, um, one of the very first comments that we got to think about is just how does the overall cattle inventory uh, affect uh, our calf and feeder cattle prices? So uh, I made the comment a while ago about supply and demand. So if you think about the cattle inventory cycle over a large period of time, so we're looking at a chart here from 1992 to 2022. Uh, we always talk about the cattle inventory cycle has got ups and downs, ups and downs. So um, and our um, the periods of the cattle inventory where we are um, whenever we're growing uh, tend to be a little bit larger than whenever we're um, in a contraction. So you can see here percent changes. So the blues uh, are positive percent changes in the cattle inventory. The reds are negative percent changes in cattle inventory. Uh, so if you uh, if you look down here in this 2007 to 2013, uh, so we know that out here in this 2013 area uh, is whenever we saw our last really big uh, prices, uh, some big paychecks that came uh, came out of our 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 calf crop whenever we marketed that. Um, we came out of that period around 2015. So between 2015, 2016, uh, the cattle inventory started growing, and then we uh, were back into a retraction period now, and estimated that we'll be in this retraction period out into uh, 2023 to 2025. I mean, just um, um, well, that's that's less to be waited to be wait to see because uh, I I don't know that Lee or I either one have a crystal ball uh, to know whenever that retraction period in, but we know just because of historics in the cattle inventory uh, that it does follow this pattern uh, year um, or over a period of time it follows that bell curve uh, like you see on this graph. So if we take that same graph. Uh, and we overlay, uh, so the blue line being our cattle inventory line, and then uh, the bars representing uh, our estimated cow-calf returns, uh, we can see, so the, the red lines being negative cow-calf returns, uh, the darker bars uh, going upward, we're going to estimate or represent a positive cow-calf return. So if we, uh, if we see that whenever our uh, our cattle inventory so we can we know that our cattle inventory over time has decreased but we can see these big dips um, that are also represented here uh, our big dips in cattle inventory um, we can also see them they may not be as obvious with this line uh, on our graph here but you can see the dips that we have in them so whenever we get those uh, those big dips in the cattle inventory supply and demand remains good for beef, our product that we're trying to produce for consumers, then we know that our um, 
our cow-calf returns are going to be higher. Uh, so here's our um, our big dip that we had in the cattle inventory around that 2013 to 2015 time frame, and we can see that we had some really, really high cow-calf returns uh, during that period of time. So um, whenever the cattle inventory started going back up over that 2016, 2017, peaked there in about 2019 and then started coming back down, uh, those cattle in, uh, cattle cow calf returns uh, were suppressed during that time. Um, so this is how ultimately supply and demand uh, affects those uh, those returns on our cow calf operations. So our seasonal pricing history, I think it's important for us to uh, to understand just seasonality of uh, of these commodities that we're dealing with. Um, and just so you can understand why uh, historically do uh, do those prices look the way they do at a, at a certain time of the year. So uh, the red dots right here representing 2022, uh, those are current prices uh, from Oklahoma City, 500 to 550 pound steers, medium and large ones and twos. The green line going out here is our 2016 to 2020 average. And then the vertical uh, blue lines are representing last year 2021 prices uh, as reported by USDA. So what I want you to look at on this slide, and we're gonna move through these fairly quickly, is I just want you to look at the overall trend of prices. So we can see that our prices on these five to 550s are uh, typically higher from a period uh, beginning in the first of the year and then they slowly drop off and we'll get out here to say the first part of June. We'll look at that period of time right there. Um, and that's a period of time that we know that, uh, that the price for that particular commodity, that five to 550, is going to be highest uh, than any other given time in a 365 day year. So the reason for that being is that 73% of the U.S. calf crop, and um, you can you can gather these numbers from USDA, uh, they're not hard to find, 73% of the U.S. calf crop is born in the first six months of the year. So the first six months of the year, 73% of the U.S. calf crop is born. So there are short supplies of this size cattle um, during that period of time, but larger supplies of that size and class of cattle um, later in the summer, particularly around August, late July, early August, whenever um, whenever these calves that are born out here are being marketed. So we have a, a short supply in this first six months of the year. So if we have a short supply, we would expect that prices and demand is still good. We would expect prices to be better. Out here at the last of the year, we have a larger supply. Uh, so we would su expect that uh, the prices will be suppressed during that time. So and I'll, I'll use a marketing um, option out there, forward contracting. So uh, if you know that you've got 50,000 pounds of cattle that could be um, sold out here and for D July, August delivery um, and you feel confident that you can forward contract those cattle for a set delivery day at a set weight, uh, you can capture these prices, these good prices back here in March and April. Uh, go ahead and lock into those prices um, to actually deliver out here whenever you wean. Uh, so if the if the market falls during that time, then you made the right decision. I mean, you're you're, you're still going to capture these good prices out here. If it rises, um, then uh, then you're not going to be able to capture those rising prices. But uh, it is a way that you can go ahead and lock in some of those prices um, that uh, those better prices that we see out here in the first six months of the year. So whenever we talk about those 750 to 800 pounds, so again, we're talking about those feeders, um, and we can see that, uh, again, we're just gonna look at the green line. Uh, we're looking at uh, um, 
lower prices in the first six months of the year and higher prices in the later months of the year and then falling off a little bit as we get towards uh, into the winter months. So the reason that we see that is a lot of these cattle out here are still in, uh, I guess storage might be a word, but they're on pasture uh, still this time of the year. Uh, very high quality pasture uh, that's available in the, in the plain states. And then we see a, a pretty good bit of movement on those cattle out here uh, starting in, um, in June, July, and the reason being is so the feedlots are um, are pretty full and start marketing a lot of cattle leading up to the grilling months. All right, so May, June, July, grilling months. So uh, the feedlots empty out a lot of cattle during that period of time in preparation for uh, grilling season. So once they get past grilling season, it's time for them to start refilling the feedlots. So uh, there is a huge demand for those feeder type cattle in this period of time around from June till uh, August, maybe into September. Um, demand for those cattle, demand coming from the feedlots uh, for those cattle is high because they're trying to refill those and uh, and start getting them, uh, start getting those cattle ready uh, for that uh, ne next phase of that production cycle. So hopefully that kind of gives you a little bit of um, um, idea or a little bit of education just in terms of uh, some historics, in terms of supply and demand. Uh, you can look at uh, uh, a lot of different factors out there. Uh, again, look at the price of corn, uh, look at what the cost of gain. So I started to put a, a slide in from Kansas State University, so they do a pretty good job of uh, providing some information out there in terms of feedlot uh, information. So uh, you can look at the entire 2021 year now in terms of cost of gain, and that cost of gain is just um, well over a dollar a pound by the time we got to the end of 2021. Uh, so you can expect that in 2022, just because of what we're seeing right now in the cost of corn, that that cost of gain is going to go up, uh, and that's going to suppress uh, the cost of uh, what we can expect to get for those feeders uh, because again the the value of that animal is going to be directly proportional to what it takes to move them through the next phase of production or next phases of production to get them uh, to the ultimate uh, uh, goal of harvesting that animal for the consumers. So looking at USDA grades of feeder cattle, uh, feeder cattle grading system provides a common language. Uh, between buyers and sellers. So those buyers are sitting up there in those auction markets. Uh, and this is uh, the, the language that's going through their head. So if we do a good job of sellers in terms of grouping cattle uh, by some of these, uh, these feeder cattle grades and we do a good job of uh, selecting some of that breeding stock uh, to, uh, to fit some of these feeder cattle grades, it makes us better marketers of our product. Uh, so they are based on frame size and muscle thickness. So uh, this chart here is giving you what we're talking about in terms of frame. So large, medium, and small is a um, uh, an evaluation of the animal skeletal size in relation to its age, uh, its predicted age or estimated age. So those large frame steers, we would expect a grade choice at about 1,250 pounds. Mediums about 1100 pounds and then those small frames less than 1100 pounds. Uh, so that's what we're talking about in terms of medium and larges. A lot of times if you've ever listened to our news updates, uh, you hear me talk about medium and large ones and twos. So that's what we're talking about medium and large. Uh, and we're talking about that skeletal size. So uh, whenever we talk about ones and twos, we're talking about muscle thickness score um, relative to the lean and fat composition of the carcass. So uh, if you look at these, these pictures are taken directly from USDA. This is what they use in terms of their standards of muscle thickness, um, all the way starting at a, a moderately thick number one, all the way down to a number four, which is typically what we would um, uh, call uh, those calves that have a large dairy influence um, and 
or they're just ultimately thin cattle. So you can look at the shape of these and you can get a pretty good idea of what we're talking about in terms of muscle shape or muscle thickness. Uh, so um, these grades allow us to better sort cattle into more uniform groups. Uh, it can also allow producers at the start of the beef production chain to evaluate their breeding and management programs to closely match the market they are trying to fit. So if we're trying to maximize profit, if we're trying to maximize the price that we're going to get for these cattle uh, at the market, then ultimately we need to be hitting in these number ones and number twos, moderately thick to slightly thick. Uh, we need a frame score in a medium and large, uh, we need muscle thickness in ones and twos. So if we do a better job of, of tailoring our production system and our breeding systems to be able to uh, to hit that uh, those type markets, then we are being more effective and more um, more profitable whenever we take those cattle to market. So this is going to be our transition slide. This will be my last one before I turn it over to Lee and he's going to go through um, a, a good conversation and, and sharing a good bit of his knowledge uh, in terms of what we can do from a management perspective to improve that calf value. Uh, so know your costs, know your market. And I get tickled at some folks that uh, they say that they're not making any money on their calf crop. Well, one of the first questions I ask, well, how do you know if you're not making any money if you don't know what your costs are? Uh, so costs can be broken down into those variable costs. They can be fixed costs. So fixed cost, uh, uh, our land rent or our land note, uh, our calf note, our equipment notes, um, and taxes, um, property taxes, all of those are going to be some of those fixed costs that we know are going to come in year after year and they're going to be pretty much the same year after year. Uh, and then our variable costs, so variable costs right now are pretty tough. Uh, fuel, fertilizer, feed, um, those, those variable costs are pretty difficult, but if we've done a good job of managing or keeping records of those costs over the last several years, we can take what our inflation is right now and hopefully estimate what those costs are going to be. Um, closely estimate uh, what those costs are going to be. Where is your market going to be? Um, and we need to have an idea of, of what that market is going to be. I mean, are we, are we going to market through our local uh, livestock market? Are we going to utilize forward contracting? Uh, are we going to be selling in single lots? Are we going to be selling in group lots? Um, and all of those things are, those are decisions that we need to be making ahead of time and tailoring our production practices to meet that market. Defining a breeding season. So Dr. Edwards and I have done a couple of talks that you can go back and watch in terms of the importance of defining a breeding season. Uh, the shorter that is, if you can get more calves born in the first 45 days of a calving season, we know that we can wean more pounds if we mark it on a set date um, uh, as compared to those calves that are born later in the calving season. Um, so if we define that breeding season, it ultimately helps us in terms of the pounds that we can market um, uh, by those calves that are born earlier in the breeding season. Selection of breeding stock. So again, if we're going to be marketing singles uh, in terms of just one head at a time, uh, then maybe uh, red-hatted cattle or cattle that have got uh, uh, painted type cattle, those type cattle may not be the best to market as singles. If we've got groups of those cattle, if we've got 20 or 30 head of them that we can market as a uniform group, uh, then, then that's going to be able to uh, draw a little bit better price than if we were taking those single heads of those red-hatted cattle or painted cattle and trying to move them through a, a livestock auction. Uh, castration, are we castrating? Are we not castrating? What are the values associated with that? Lee is going to talk about along with dehorning. 
Uh, and then managing body condition. Um, and it, I think a lot of times whenever we hear, uh, or even us in extension, we talk about creep feeding. Uh, I think a lot of folks, um, um, we might get a little bit carried away in terms of putting too much flesh on cattle through the creep feeding process. So if we talk about preconditioning, so 45 to 60 day preconditioning period, we don't always have to use feed in that preconditioning period. We can do that with a forage. So all we're trying to do is keep cattle in a preconditioning period. We're trying to keep them on a positive plane of growth. Uh, that positive plane of growth may be a half a pound. It may be three quarters of a pound a day. That doesn't necessarily have to be a pound and a half to two pounds a day. Uh, so we can do that positive plane of growth with a good quality forage instead of going out and putting uh, more money into that product just through purchasing of commodities or feeds. And then managing feel and shrink. Uh, Lee is going to talk a little bit about the importance of managing that field. Why are those important to us whenever we move that cattle from home to the market? And why do we need to make sure that we are managing that and how does that affect our market? So uh, with that being said, I'm going to advance the slide and Lee, mute my microphone and camera and I'm going to turn it over to you. Hello everyone, glad to be with y'all here today. And Jason has brought up just a, a, a wealth of knowledge in, on these subjects about marketing cattle and and getting your cattle ready to market and about um, and about understanding markets markets and marketing uh, reports. And you know, listening to his talk, I just was thinking we've got a short time here, and there were several topics that Jason alluded to that really you could talk for an hour or, or longer about individually and that is much the same about what i'm uh going to talk about with you all here today um i'm going to feed off some of what jason said and the first thing jason i, I guess i should let y'all know jason's going to advance the slides for me uh i have trouble walking and chewing gum at the same time so uh i get tongue tied a lot and it, it's just much better that way so the first slide that you're going to see, and this is where it all begins uh, with profitability on your calf crop. The conversation uh, about how to incre increase calf prices, it always starts with genetics. And I know what you're thinking. Whenever you go to talking about genetics, people think, well, I've spent the last 40 years or 50 years building up my cow herd. I'm not going to sell out, um, then buy back with a different set of cattle, you know, especially uh, during times of market upheaval. And that's not really the point I'd like to make with this. Instead, uh, uh, focusing on the quality of your cow herds, which should be on our minds when choosing uh, our replacement heifers, replacement cows, I'd like to focus on the sire side of things, if you will. And uh, how many of you have ever heard the expression, a bull is half your herd? That's a pretty common expression in the beef cattle world. and. Uh, but how about we take it a step further? A bull is half your herd unless he's a poor one, and then he's all the herd. Simply put, half your calf crops genetics comes from the bulls you use. So choosing those lower, lower quality bulls or ones with undesirable traits can have an outsized effect on the quality of your calves when it comes time to market them. Saving a couple of hundred dollars per head on the bulls you buy, it can really have a huge impact on your bottom line when the time comes to market your calves. Okay, Jason, I believe we're ready to move to the next one. And this is a kind of a side-by-side -side, uh, picture. Take a look at them. Notice the difference in these two pictures. Now, I got to admit to y'all that the one on the left, that's a picture from a bull sale catalog. So he, he's, he's, in a, he's in a good condition as far as body condition. And, and I don't know what his selling price was. But the bull on the right, you look at him, he definitely needs some groceries. But aside from the body condition of the two bulls, you'll notice some quality differences between the two. The bull on the left, you notice he's deep bodied, he's even, he's well muscled, big of bone. The bull on the right, he's finer of bone, definitely. You can tell some uh, real, a lot looking at his, his uh, bone density and such. 
Uh, he's more shallow, shallower, I guess would be the better, better way to say it, as far as depth of body, and he's finer bone, like I said. Now think just a second about what traits the calves from these bulls will have. Think about what's going to happen when you turn these bulls out on your cows. Now I'm not here telling you that you have to go to a registered bull sale and buy a bull that costs uh, more than your house did when you uh, bought it, but on the other side of things, maybe buying the cheapest bull from your neighbor is not the best move. Too much rides on your choice of sires for your calf crop to, to save a buck or two on a bull. Uh, we've got numerous uh, quality bull uh, providers, uh, registered producers around this state that you need to take advantage of if possible. Okay, Jason. And Jason alluded to this uh, in, in his portion of the talk for sure, and it really matters. And I don't want this conversation to devolve into what breed is the best because we all have our personal preferences and uh, each breed has its merits in, in the state. However, you'll notice that hide color does indeed matter. And this is part of a study done in Arkansas using calf sale data from Arkansas from sale barns up there. And uh, notice you don't see a wide variety between the black hided, uh, yellow, whites, grays, and I, I, I put in, in parentheses in my little notes I'm following, excluding rat-tailed calves, and that may be a conversation best say for another day. Uh, reds or any crosses, you don't see much variation as far as that average selling price. But then take a look at what the discounts those painted, spotted, striped up cattle uh, can occur. Uh, they can incur heavily discounted prices. Um, and that's based just off of expected performance on those uh, spotted cattle when, on the end product side of things. Okay, Jason. To cut or not to cut, uh, most everyone in the cattle business knows that castrating those bull calves increases their value. This is a study out of Tennessee and it, it reinforces that old adage. If you'll take a look at the average discount by head as you go through the weight ranges, you look starting on those uh, four weight cattle, uh, you don't see quite the discount that you see on the other end of the spectrum, the seven weight cattle. Uh, you're looking at uh, 2015 to current, $29 on your four weights, and up to the seven weights, you're looking at $139, that's dollars per head discount um, based off the results of this study. Um, you, and you think about it just a minute, why those discounts increase with the size of the, of the steer bull calf. Uh, basically, that's due to the recovery time and the risk there. You know, we all know that uh, castrating those bull calves is a lot easier on them and us uh, on those lower weight ranges than it is on the high weight ranges. The other thing I want to call your mind to when you're looking at this, you've got two data points on this. One is 2010 to 2014, but then look at 2015 to current, and you'll see a trend here that these discounts are getting larger over time. So these buyers of these calves are, are building in that discount for having to steer, uh, castrate your calves. Uh, they're building it into the price that they pay for your calves. So, you know, whenever you sell a bull calf, just know that he's going to get steered uh, one way or another, whether you do it at home, let him recover and take advantage of that price increase, or you sell him, take a, a, a hit on your, your price when you sell. Uh, just know that it's going to happen it's just a matter of when, where, and who gets the, the financial incentive to do that. Okay, Jason. Do horns make a difference? And I debated including this slide uh, due to the fact that overall, we're seeing less horn calves hit the market as what they once were, but, but we're still seeing them. And Jason and I talked back and forth on this, and he said definitely include it. So I, 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 that's why you're seeing it there. And if you're raising calves that display horns at marketing time, just know they're going to be discounted. And dehorning, like the like we talked about castrating, uh, the earlier you do it, the easier it'll be on the calves and on you. Uh, and, and the recovery time definitely matters on this. This is uh, what you're seeing on this slide is a study 
done down in South Texas by some Texas A&M AgriLife folks. Uh, horn calves received a $6.30 per hundredweight discount relative to polled or dehorned calves. And that indicates that the revenue benefit, now uh, keep in mind this is 2015, the revenue benefit of selecting poll genetics or dehorning your calves well prior to marketing was $31.50 per 500 pound calf. So we're seeing a, a, a pretty good uh, discount placed on those calves uh, that, that are horned at, at selling time. And just as we, I stated with castrating the calves, those calves with horns, they're gonna get dehorned. It's just a matter of where, where it happens and, and who takes the discount or who pays a premium for it. Okay, Jason. Now, take a look at these two pictures and let's talk just a minute about some of the concepts Jason alluded to concerning market reports, and body conditions of your calves at market time. These two pictures, I, I would say, are examples of extremes. The Charlotte cross steer on the left, he needs some groceries for sure. I think everybody would have gone that. If you hang around the sale barn or around cattle buyers long enough, you'll hear the phrase, those cattle are hard, those calves are hard. Simply put, hard calves aren't very full and don't have high fat levels. These calves generally don't lose a lot of weight during the buying, shipping, and backgrounding phase. The group of calves on the right is the other side of the coin. These calves, I, you can assume, are on lush pasture by what it shows. Uh, and think about your calves or, or yearlings coming off ryegrass. That would be an example I guess I was going for. A buyer might refer to these as gobby fat. That's the kind of one of those slang words you'll hear in the cattle industry, and you may not exactly know what it means. Uh, these calves, gobby fat calves, will lose quite a bit of weight when you run them through the sale barn or through the market and when they get to their ultimate buyer. Uh, so what would you shoot for as far as body condition on your calves? And this re reminds me of an expression my grandfather used and. He didn't coin it for sure because I've heard it from many different people. You can't starve a profit out of a set of cattle, but you can go broke feeding them. Okay, Jason. Does body condition matter? Maybe this slide puts it into perspective a little bit more. This is part of the same research project I alluded to in an earlier talk out of Arkansas. And notice the body conditions listed and how they relate to the average selling price. I think the very thin category can be a little misleading because we shouldn't shoot for selling thin calves. Uh, that hurts our bottom line, the image of our industry for sure. Uh, but take a look though at how the fleshy and fat calves get discounted. Weaning and preconditioning is a popular concept like Jason was talking about, and we'll discuss it a little more in detail here in just a minute. But I wanted to bring it up now so you, you could understand that weaning and preconditioning calves does not mean that you have to have high weight gains during this process. The goal of a preconditioning or a weaning period is to ensure weight gains continue, the cattle remain healthy and growing and ready to move into the next phase. You're not trying to finish them out as fat cattle during the preconditioning phase. The concept of body condition can be difficult sometimes to get your mind around, but don't misunderstand what I'm saying here, fellas. Starving cattle or intentionally keeping them thin does not make you money in the long run. Okay, Jason. So what about feel? Feel is another concept that can be difficult to understand. And think back to that picture of that Charlay steer there from a few slides ago. We would consider him shrunk or gaunt. Simply put, he appeared hollowed out or empty, like maybe he'd been off hay or water for a while. Assume you buy that steer and you bring him home, uh, put, him, put him on some good hay, some feed, pasture. He'd fill out considerably and look like a new animal uh, and gain uh, considerable weight during the process. Uh, however, buying a steer that appears full will likely lose a little weight or at best maintain his current weight when you bring him home. As with body condition, please don't think I'm suggesting removing your calves from hay, water, or feed uh, dear, prior to selling. Uh, that would be a train wreck in and of itself. I just wanted to include this slide and portions of this study for you to see that that average um, 
that average selling price, you, you move on from there and look at the full, you notice that discount, $8 uh, on, on the full cattle. I think this slide just reinforces the fact that selling fat or gobby calves will result in a slight discount over the more average body conditions. Okay, Jason. A careful balance is truly needed. This is a picture Jason took several years ago, and I feel like it's a good representation of kind of some of the concepts I've been talking about. So take a look there at the calf on the right, number 143, I believe. My eyesight's not that good. This calf is approaching weaning and should be considered an average body type. He's not too full, but he's in good condition, and his buyer would not think he's going to lose a lot of weight after he purchases him and backgrounds him before he gets to the next phase of his life whether it be a wheat field, summer grazing, a grow lot, or a feed lot. And, and that's something we got to keep in mind. Our calves, when they exit that sale ring loaded on the buyer's truck, they're going on to other phases, and those buyers are pricing your cattle de uh, dependent, of course, on market conditions, but also how these calves are going to perform in that next phase. They're anticipating how well they're going to perform, and that can have a huge bearing on our price. All right, Jason, a word about shrink. Shrink in beef cattle, I'm just going to read this definition because I thought it was a pretty good one. Shrink in beef cattle is weight loss that occurs between an animal's departure from one location and weigh in at another. The shrink occurs as a result of gut feel or tissue loss from the animal. Shrink in beef calves constitutes a potential economic loss to both the seller and the buyer if it is not fully considered. And there's two main types of shrink I'm going to just fly through real quick. That's field shrink and tissue sh shrink. Field shrink is loss of rumen uh, feel, urine and manure, sometimes uh, associated with short times off feed, hay, or water. Think about pulling calves up, holding them for a few hours, they hollow out a little bit. Tissue shrink is, is a, a bird of another feather though. That's extracellular and intracellular fluid loss. And it's mainly associated with those long times off of feed, hay, and water. Okay. Um, I think we're ready to move to the next one, Jason. Shrink affects your bottom line, whether you realize it or not. This is a research study, study done by the folks at Oklahoma State. Basically, they pin several sets of similar type calves at different times, move them to a sale facility. Notice the shrink percentages. Basically, the calves were peeing, basically the calves peeing closer to the time they were weighed or sold, lost less weight, they shrunk less. This is kind of a common sense statement when you think about it, but shrink is one of those hidden factors that cost cattle producers thousands or if not millions of dollars each year if you look at the industry as a whole. As cattle producers, we know that our calves will shrink between the time we gather them and the time we weigh or sell them. We can't avoid shrink. You just can't. But you rather you should factor on managing it. Simply put, if you're selling your calves straight off the cows, try to minimize the time between pinning them and selling them. If you have to hold them for an extended period of time, say overnight, uh, a lot of us have have uh, nine to five jobs or seven to four or, or whatever uh, jobs in town. We have to pin our cattle when we can pin them, uh, no matter what the, the sale time. So we need to be aware of how to manage that. And basically that means uh, providing them with plenty of hay, water, possibly feed, try to keep them eating, trying to keep them from shrinking to an extreme. If you haul a set of calves to the sale barn a day or two before the sale, many of us do that. Make sure that the barn provides hay, water, feed to them uh, on site there. And one final note I'd like to mention on this study. If you'll take a look at the gathering times, kind of put that into perspective and take it with a grain of salt, I guess. Uh, they use 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 a.m., and 9 a.m. We live in Louisiana, fellas. And from May to October, pinning and shipping cattle from mid-morning uh, on will most likely cause more shrink and stress due to heat, not only on the cattle, but us, uh, than an early morning pinning. 
So, so just take that with a grain of salt. All right, Jason. So what about this weaning and precondition? And this is not going to be a talk about weaning and precondition. We've covered that in past webinars. And just know that selling weaned or preconditioned can pay off in some, some circumstances. This is a study done using superior livestock data, you know, the, the uh, online auction or satellite auction uh, format from 2017. You'll notice a higher price point for those calves that are enrolled in what they call VAC 45 or that are weaned and had their shots. It's fairly evident that weaning pays when you're selling those load lots. And when we're talking about load lots, we're talking about 48 to 50,000 pounds of like type and kind cattle. That means they're pretty uniform uh, of the same uh, sex, al although you can sell some mixed loads um, and, and around the same weight ranges. You'll notice on this little study they did, the, high, the highest prices uh, achieved were uh, on, on their VAC 45 and then their wean plus viral shots. Uh, then you notice kind of the contrast on those non weaned uh, cattle, they're a pr pretty significant discount, especially on a load lot of cattle. Okay, Jason. So when we're talking about weaning preconditioning, let's bring it down though to those of us that aren't able to sell uh, load lots of cattle. It's a little uh, trickier to determine if weaning and preconditioning pays when you sell less than a load, like selling individual cattle at your local sale barn. Most sale barns in Louisiana though, and this has been something of a recent addition within the last 10 years, have started having weaned and preconditioned sales. And depending on market conditions, you can see a premium for calves or yearlings that you enroll in them. And you look right here at some work done out of Texas A&M, uh, some data they showed on preconditioned calves showed them selling almost $70 per head more than similar calves. I've seen some other estimates of anywhere from seven cents a pound to 15 cents per pound premiums uh, after the preconditioning costs. Preconditioning is a is a tricky subject and it's not a uniform subject. What works best for uh, Jason may not work best for me. And then you get into some market conditions that can throw a, a wrench into the um, uh, into the gears for sure. And I'm going to uh, close this slide off by saying more data is definitely needed in Louisiana on the topic of these Louisiana based sales, uh, weaned or preconditioned sales. OK, Jason, that leads me to the final thoughts. Uh, cons uh, consult with your buyer auction well before you plan on marketing caves. Uh, that doesn't matter whether you're selling to another person, private treaty to a buyer, uh, to a local sale barn or, uh, or what have you. Visit with them well before. Get a plan in place. Uh, take what Jason said to heart about the times whenever you realize the highest prices on these calves and try to plan accordingly. Um, take time if you're selling at an auction barn to visit it. Um, you know, uh, we don't have the USDA reporting for these sale barns anymore in, in Louisiana, but most every sale barn puts out market reports on social media, and that's a great thing. That's a great service they provide. But when you look at them, they don't offer the different grades like USDA reports offer. They just offer weight ranges. And so it's very important in my mind to travel to that market, sit down, watch these calves sell, watch what sells better, uh, watch what uh, may, may sell at a little discount and try to avoid that. And, and that's something that is done well in advance of marketing your calves. Um, if you sell private treaty to a buyer or another individual, another farmer or rancher, agree on the price before the calves change hands. I've seen this happen. I've seen train wrecks on this where folks will, will, will sell to another person and they won't agree on a price until the calves show up. And this can really create problems on both ends. And to, uh, the, that leads into the next one, which is sell on a certified set of scales. Uh, no matter if you sell at a sale barn or to a, a, a local buyer or to a private treaty, another farmer, 
Uh, all sales, if they're based on pounds, should be on certified scales, scales certified by the Louisiana Department of Agriculture and Forestry. Make sure that you're selling on those just so that it's a fair medium. So nobody comes in out on the shorter end of the stick. Inquire about those upcoming value added calf sales. What we just talked about, weaned or preconditioned, you know, uh, uh, try, try to get in on that. Do everything you can to increase uh, the, your calf value at marketing. Uh, as Jason alluded to in his portion, uniform groups, truckload lots, 48 to 50,000 pounds, generally bring more money. Now, the average cattle producer in Louisiana can't come up with a truckload of like type and kind uh, calves at, at once. But you start thinking about some neighbors, start thinking about your buddy down the road who might be able to put some cattle. Y'all you know, use the same type of bulls, have similar breeding seasons, so on and so forth. There's a distinct possibility there that you could put together with another uh, farmer or rancher or, or more than one farmer and get uh, get a load put together to take advantage of those um, higher prices. This is a statement. If you don't remember anything else, please remember this. Livestock auctions want your calves to bring the most money possible. Remember how livestock auctions business plan is, is structured. They make money off of commission on selling your calves. So naturally, the more dollars they can get out of your uh, your calf, the more money they get in commission. And I, I think there's a big disconnect sometimes between uh, producers and, and, and sale barns. They, oh, they give my calves away. They, they, they gave them away. Well, that's not in their best interest to do that. Instead of looking at whether they gave them away, maybe take a look at uh, some of the factors that we've talked about that may have made your calves not as marketable. Now, I'm not saying that uh, all livestock auctions are uh, that that they that they uh, have halo on halos on their head and are innocent in all matters, but just keep in mind that that's how they make their money is by getting uh, the most money they can out of your cattle. These simple practices you look at that we've been talking about uh, when they are applied at home can make a huge difference in uh, in in the marketability of your calf crop, and with that. Ashley and Jason, I believe that I have rambled on long enough. We've covered a wide variety of subjects in a very short amount of time. All right, thank you both. Um, so just a reminder for those of you that are on live with us right now, you can put any questions that you have into the Q&A box. Um, so you should be able to see that on your screen. If you've called in, you can text questions to me. Uh, my number is 512-818. 5476. So you'll have just a few minutes to go ahead and get those questions in if you have them and um, we'll send them over to to Jason and Lee. I am going to try to see if I can share my screen. Um, maybe it'll go. So I hope there it goes. Um, so while you're, you're thinking about any questions that you have, um, we do ask that you please take just a couple of minutes and it's just it's three to five questions on the survey um, and give us your feedback on the webinar. So there's a couple of ways to do that. Um, the easiest way right now for those of you that are live is to use the camera on your phone to view the QR code on the screen um, and go in and it'll take you directly. You'll see a little banner. They'll take you directly to the survey. Um, I also, in the recording of this, um, if you're on the video or the podcast, I will post the link, the direct link to the survey there too. Um, and that brings me to, we are recording these. Um, we do always record them if you're new to watching them live. Um, if you want to go back and reference it, um, I'll have it up probably sometime next week. And so you can go back in and you can see all those. Um, Jason and Lee had their contact information a while ago. If you have any questions for them, you can send it to them directly. Um, and so I don't see any questions for y'all today. Um, again, as I just mentioned, uh, Lee had had both of their contact information on, on the video here just um, a few minutes before. So you can reach out to them. Um, you can always reach out to me. My contact information will be in the description as well. As well. Jason, go ahead. You have something? Yeah, I just wanted to say one thing before we get wrapped up here. Uh, so I hope that that folks that that watch this will understand that 
I think a lot of times we always we get into the mindset in order to add value or increase uh, the um, the marketability or the um, to get a higher price for our our products, our cattle. We've got to spend a lot of money or spend more money to do that. And I hope uh, Lee and I have have given you some things to think about that not necessarily are going to cost you a whole lot of money. These are management practices that that you can take and start implementing on your individual place. And Lee said it many times. I mean, a lot of this is is decision play, decision making that needs to take place well before the marketing opportunity. Uh, so hopefully, we've 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 effectively communicated the fact that you can do this without. I mean, yes, there are ways out there that you can do it, and you can spend a good bit of money. Um, but hopefully, we've we have communicated that you can do some things on a management perspective, not spending a whole lot of money and still increase the value of that calf crop. Thank you. Um, so I don't see any questions for y'all. Um, I want to let y'all know our next webinar is going to be on Tuesday, April 12th. Um, we'll have Dr. Christine Navarre coming in and doing a talk on herd health. Um, so again, that'll be live um, at 1030 on April 12th, and we'll send out information for that. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, we hope that you have a great week.